Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, and we'll read from verse 5. And the simple question this morning, or the title if you like, who do you trust or what do you trust? It's a question for all of us today, isn't it? And uh, I hope that the Lord does bless your heart and encourage you and challenge us this morning as he has with me and is doing as the days go by and we see things happening in this world and we are faced with so many things and so many questions about what's happening in the world and questions uh, surrounding, you know, the vaccine and, you know, is it right, is it wrong, you know, Lord, what is going on? We've got so many questions. And I was just so encouraged as my dad was preaching last Sunday, wasn't he, on the, on the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Despite all the uncertainty, you know, our eyes are just to be on <laughs> the Lord who is high and lifted up. Amen. He never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Um, and the question is for us, who do we trust? So we're going to look at a few verses this morning and we'll go to a few others as we uh, uh, um, look to the Lord to help us this morning. But let me just pray and ask the Lord to help me this morning. Amen. So, Father, as we come to your word, we come so with awe and reverence again. We don't want to do so lightly. We know that, Lord, these words were written down, Lord, in your divine provision uh, for us, um, that we may be a little church here today in Three Mile Cross, uh, uh, Lord, to join together to read these words even in our language. And, Lord, we know that that's even cost the lives of so many of your servants. And so we want to recognize that this morning and not come to your word lightly, but we also know that, Lord, unless you reveal things by your Holy Spirit, they are just words on a piece of paper. And therefore, we ask you this morning that you would, Lord, as it were, as you touch the lips of Isaiah, Lord, and you touch the lips of the, the preacher this morning, Lord, that there would not be my opinions and not my thoughts. There would not be anything of the flesh this morning, but I pray that, Lord, that which is of you would flourish, would take root, and would accomplish that for which it is sent out for, Lord. I pray this morning that we would hear from heaven, that even I would hear from you as I come and have this wonderful privilege to minister your word this morning. And I pray that you'd encourage our church. Lord, I pray for upright from the start that there will be no condemnation. The enemy so loves to put condemnation on us, but we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we thank you that we can throw that off from the start. We thank you that in you we have life and we have life eternal because of the blood of Jesus as we have just remembered this morning. So help us as we look at these words. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which, is, which spreads out its roots uh, by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. We'll just read up to there for now. And uh, this is an amazing passage. And, and, you know, the whole book of Jeremiah is so fascinating because if you really study, you know, um, the poor guy, you know, the ministry that he had, you know, and uh, being a prophet of God, he was known as the weeping prophet. And, you know, really poured his whole heart and soul into it and was so obedient to the Lord. But it's like it just almost like it had no effect on the hearers. And the frustration that must have been uh, in his heart as he was doing it. And he was seeing all the evil around about him. And here we see 
something about uh, the heart of God. You know, you can read the Old Testament through, but, uh, and of course as Christians, you know, we, we, we're under the New Covenant. And so we spend a lot of time in the New Testament, rightly so, I believe. But, you know, it's wonderful that you can read back into the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and you see the same God. There's no separation between the, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And, and I trust we all know that in this church. It is the same God. It's the same Father. Amen. And even His Son, His Holy Spirit, the Trinity at work all the way through. And you see it sometimes so much more, I think, in the Old Testament that you see that God speaks into the very heart of His people that were so bound by all the do's and the don'ts, if you like, and the, the religious things that they had to keep to. And God setting them aside and called them aside to be His people. And how they get so caught up with the things that they are supposed to do that they forget the very fa- their very Father in Heaven, their very God who called them out of Egypt. And time after time after time, He has to remind them of how He brought them out of Egypt, how He called them out by His mighty arm, not because of their you know, righteousness or anything of them. It's, it's all by grace, and it's, it's the same for us today. We can take no credit for our salvation. It is all because of the Lord and His amazing grace toward us. And you see at times the Lord speaks through His prophets to His people as He does here, and He warns them when He sees them drifting away, when He sees them erring, and they're going according to their own ways. And this is something, a theme that comes up so many times. And I remember I've shared it many times with us. You know, if you could cut, bisect the Bible in half, apparently I was told that, you know, equal amount of words or verses, you know, Psalm 118 verse 8, which says, better to trust in the Lord than to trust in man. Better to trust in the Lord than it is to trust in princes. And uh, I want to call you out on that one because apparently that's not true. It's not the center of the Bible. So I don't know how many went home and actually counted the verses on either side. <laughs> but that is not, they say, the very center of the Bible. But still, amazing passage. And you know, just for interest's sake, you know what they said is the center of the Bible. Totally irrelevant to know what is the center of the Bible. But this is the message. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. (laughs) That is apparently the center of the Bible. But as we've looked at before, you know, that theme of do not trust in man or princess, all those things, your trust must be in the Lord. And this is the heart of Almighty God, and that has not changed throughout the ages, and it will not change. Because He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the one who made you. He's the one who made me. (laughs) He knows everything about us. Nothing we can hide from Him. And we can see, as God says here, through Jeremiah in verse 5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord. This is a question we can ask ourselves this morning. It is so easy to put our trust in the ways of man. Particularly in the time that we live. Yeah, We've just put a rover on Mars, another one. It's not even the first one. How many people were shocked when they found out that there's a rover landing on Mars? They realized that wasn't even the first one. (laughs) They had other ones (laughs) you know, roaming around on the planet Mars. We're living in an amazing time in human history. Information boom. There's just incredible. And you think of that uh, prophecy of Daniel where knowledge shall increase. If we're not living in that time, then I don't know. Never before have we seen such a technology boom, such a knowledge at our very fingertips. You can sit in a lecture room listening to a professor lecturing his heart out on a specific topic and students will be on their laptops, whatever, Googling on Wikipedia, seeing <laughs> you know, what other views there are, much to the frustration. Everything is at our fingertips these days. And we look at what mankind has made and we see what we have built and we see some of the amazing cities throughout the world. And the technology, it is astonishing, friends. We stand in awe when we see the things that humanity has come up with. And indeed, like it says in Genesis, if they put there, remember, they were all of one language before the Tower of Babel. God actually said, if they put their minds to there's nothing that they cannot do. And God confounded them. He confused them, but the languages, didn't he? 
But now we're living in a time again where language is not really so much of a barrier because it's Google Translate, it's high technology and how to communicate you know, all over the world. You can phone a call center now about something with your own telephone or something and speak to somebody on the other side of the planet that's got you know, <laughs> part in, in what the things that are going on in your home. We are so connected, so connected. And it is an amazing thing that we see around about us. But the danger is that we can so easily begin to put our trust in these things. So easily. So easily. I want to say right from the outset, I'm not against technology. I'm not against, you know, uh, the things that God, and I believe he's given us intellect. He's given, he's gifted people with knowledge. You know, you think of the medical doctors, you think of uh, you know, experts in certain fields, and I mean, they're amazing people. God has gifted them with knowledge. And I'm not against that at all, but there is a danger. And where that line is, I don't know, that danger, that line that we cross, where we begin to put our trust in the knowledge of man. And how many times, friends, and I'm sure you'd agree with me, even here in our nation, you know, we listen to the speeches of our government that we pray for so much. And we just long for them to say those words. Oh, that we would just call upon the name of, uh, of our Lord. We need his help. That we would pray. And thank God for this, or thank God for this, and given any kind of acknowledgement to the God of the universe. But instead, we hear we're trusting in science, and we are led by the data, and science will prevail, and once more, humanity will kick back. And we hear this, and we, we, we so easily can get caught up in the flow of that, you see, because there's a triumph <laughs> in that, when humanity prevails, and we've kicked this virus back, as it were. <laughs> and you can see the celebrations already beginning as the vaccine and all these things begin to have their effect. And our people are beginning to think humanity's done it again. And there's a pride that rises up. And you know, this so easily happens amongst God's people. And this is what God says. He says, cursed is the man who trusts in a man and makes his flesh his strength. You know, it's like God says, you know, he puts a curse on them. But if you think it through for a minute, there's already a curse on that person who only puts their trust in man because already we know this human nature of ours and our very, uh, the, 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 the earth is, is under a curse, separated from God that took place at the fall of humanity. And so that's why God can easily say through his prophet here, cursed is the man who trusts in man. It's a foolish thing to do in light of God and his majesty and his power and his glory who makes flesh his strength and whose heart departs from the Lord. And he's speaking to his people, friends, how easy it is for our hearts to depart from the Lord. And we get caught up with the things in this world, yeah? And he says, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert. It's a pretty gloomy picture. He shall not see when good comes. Good things may happen and you won't even see it. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Nobody wants to be there. Okay? Nobody. But that is how God describes those who put their faith and their trust in mere human beings and human knowledge. But verse 7 says to us, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. I pray that is every single one of us here this morning. We trust in the Lord. We know, we see what's happening around about us. We see the vaccine. We thank God for something. I know there's differing views, all that. But people praise God for the breakthroughs and the things that we see. But our trust is in God. It's not in human science. It's not in human knowledge. Because we know, even when we studied the Bible, there are so many other things that will come upon the face of this planet that humanity will have no answer for. And so it's a foolish place to be, to put your trust in human science and the ways of man. Whilst we thank God for our medical expertise and all these things, but our trust as believers should always be in God, not in the things of this world. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes, because the heat will come, <laughs> as we know. 
And the picture here is a steadfast, strong tree standing by the waters. And there is a drought and there's a heat wave withering everything in its sight. And yet that tree remains steadfast and bearing its fruit without ceasing. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Who would agree with me this morning that we're going through something of a drought in the time that we live, friends? This whole world is changing before our very eyes. Everything seems to be shaken. If nature itself is groaning, as we see, there's volcanoes erupting, there's earthquakes. I mean, there's an 8.1 just off the coast of New Zealand, wasn't there, the other day. Massive things are happening all over the world that we are told of in the Word of God. And we see the effect of the after effects of this global pandemic and all these things that are happening. There is, as it were, a drought. There is a difficult time. But the question is, those trees who are planted, those who trust in the Lord, they will not be anxious in the year of the drought. And on top of that, they will, uh, nor will cease from yielding fruit. They'll continue to bear their fruit. This is a sure test for each and every one of us. When you're squeezed from all sides <laughs> because of the pressures of life, what comes out? Is it a despair? Is it depression? Anxiety? Fear-stricken? Or do you just happily still go along, bearing the fruit that God has ordained for you to bear? That is a sure sign. And there's nothing more comforting than when you're in the presence of a steadfast, and I mean a steadfast believer, <laughs> and you're going through a difficult time, and they just swoop in and out of your life, and it's just, they just you, you, it's contagious, isn't it? When they're just steadfast in their faith, and it doesn't matter what happens in the world, you know they are rooted in the Word of God, and they have got a strong faith in Him. <laughs> And with all the love of God, they will just come and speak into your life and just lift you up. Oh, how we need strong Christians like that in the time that we live. There is a wonderful, wonderful blessing for those who keep trusting in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. Friends, and I believe, you know, uh, Jeremiah is looking back to Psalm 1, isn't he? And you can have a look at Psalm 1 in your own time where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit, fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. What a blessing. What a blessing for those who trust in the Lord. And this is a, a real a, a, a check for us this morning, okay? So, is our trust in the world and in human beings and human knowledge, or is our trust in the living God, the very one who created us, yeah? And I hope this is where we're at, we're trusting in God. But Jeremiah gives us in verse 9 another warning that is far more subtle and far more dangerous. And we need to take heed what he says in verse 9, he says, of Jeremiah 17, verse 9, he says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I'll read that again. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Friends, this is such a powerful, strong, what's the word, warning to us this morning, each and every one of us. How many times have you even heard it in movies and stories, or even people just, you know, they talk about encouraging you and give you advice, follow your heart, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. What does your heart tell you to do in this instance? Just follow your heart. We've all heard that. <laughs> it's so anti-biblical. Yet it sounds so right. It's not biblical. When the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful above all things 
and desperately wicked. It's like it's incurably wicked. Who can know it? Only the Lord will search the heart and test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God always sees the heart of his people. Although they were ticking all the boxes in their religion, or they were doing all the things in the temple, all the right things, if their hearts weren't right, God called them out on it time and time again. And Jeremiah spoken of this again. In Jeremiah 11 verse 8, I'll just read it. It says, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. Jeremiah 14, 14, They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Jeremiah 16, 12, Each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. You see how their people were deceived by their own very hearts. Friends, we've been spending time in the Gospel of John, and we're going to just turn there very briefly this morning. Back to John chapter 2, please. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Desperately wicked. That is absolutely true. Only God knows what is going on. In the, you know, you ask yourself so many questions when you see some of these great leaders that we look up to, and how many have we seen in our own time fall? You know, through scandals. You think of, you know, Ravi Zacharias and many of these things, examples like that. And you think, how? How can these things happen? They helped so many people. And you realize their heart is deceitful, wicked. Who can know it? It's a terrible tragedy. And the ones that deceive us most is ourselves. We need help. <laughs> you see, we need help. Only God knows the heart. We, don't, we deceive ourselves. But praise God for the Son of God. I want to read from John chapter 2, from verse 23. Now, this is after Jesus had performed his first sign. He turned the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. And then after that, he went and he cleansed the temple. Yeah, we were just talking about it. A few of us were talking about it this morning, you know, and, and, and about the fruit of the Spirit and patience particularly. And we think, well, yeah, patience is also... Jesus going into the temple and making a whip and <laughs> driving people out, as somebody once said, a preacher once said, and Jesus wasn't acting very Christ-like in this <laughs> instant, was he? But his zeal for God's house is burning him up. A righteousness, totally sinless. And just after this cleansing of the temple, in verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Jesus did so many miracles. John's told us, as I've read before, that if he grew, you know, could be recorded, then there'd be not enough books in the whole world to contain it. Jesus was constantly doing miracles. Astonished people. And many began to believe in his name. Many even began to call him Messiah because of these amazing miracles that they saw before their eyes. But verse 24 says, But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. You know, if you want to paraphrase that and have a look at the original text and look at commentaries, it's like Jesus is almost saying they began to believe in his name, but Jesus did not commit himself to them. It's like he didn't trust them. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew exactly like we read in Jeremiah. Remember, he is God in the flesh. He saw into their very hearts. He knew exactly what was going on on the inside. While well, everybody else might be praising and saying, but wonderful, everyone's calling him Messiah. They're believing in the name of Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm not committing myself to them. I know what's in their heart. I know what's in their heart. And this is a chilling thing for us, isn't it? And you know, I was reading this through and praying about this. And you look at it in context. You always got to look at it in context. You know, this is chapter divisions as we know. These things were added later on. 
to make it easy for us. But these things are just written, one, one, one whole thing. Now, if you read that in context, it says, Now, when he was in Jerusalem, verse 23, at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There was a certain man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That's what it says in my NKJV version. Other Bibles may say, but there was a man, or now there was a man. And we always focus on John chapter 3 as that amazing evangelistic passage, don't we? This discussion that Jesus has with this great leader of the, the Pharisees, Nicodemus. And he tells him the amazing thing that you must be born again. But if you read it in context here, Jesus just basically said, I'm not committing myself to these people because I know what's in their hearts. I know what's in their hearts. And he needed no one to testify of man, for he knew what was in man. In man. But if you'd like to read it this way, but there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And we can clearly see in this passage when you've read it through, friends, Jesus commits himself to this man. A man that we look at and we think, oh, Nicodemus, you fool, how can you not understand? Yet Jesus saw something in this man and he committed himself to him. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night, verse 2, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a great teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Just like many others have began to believe in his name. But listen to what Jesus says to him, friends. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or other translations may say born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Friends, that has not changed throughout history. We may come to a level of appreciation of who Jesus is. We may even marvel at the miracles that we see and the signs and the wonders and all those things. But all the time, Jesus knows exactly what's in our hearts. And this has not changed. We cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. <laughs> unless you are born again of the Spirit of God and you made alive unto Him. Because this fallen creature cannot inherit eternal life because my heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Desperately wicked. And I need to be changed. In fact, I need to die and be revived by the Spirit of God and become a very whole, complete new creature in Christ Jesus. This is the gospel message. And I pray that we would be those who would just come to that place in the time that we live. Friends, I believe we're living in such a crucial time and whilst there is so much uncertainty, I look at it this way. I praise God for what is happening because what is happening, it is making it easier for Christians to make that quality decision. Am I going to trust God or am I going to trust the things of this world? And where is our trust this morning? Now those are, the, I guess, the easy decisions. But when we are caught up in our own self-deception, that is a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. And we see this through many countless examples of people who fall through sin and they're living a double life. And somewhere they have convinced themselves in a wicked, evil heart that it's okay. That it's okay. And I want to challenge every single one of us this morning. Don't you buy that lie of the enemy, many, any minute longer. If you and I know that we are living in something that's not pleasing unto God, it's not pleasing unto God. Don't deceive yourself. Don't make your own, but wrap yourself in some kind of self-righteousness. Come to the one who can save you, who can heal you, who can help you break free from that addiction or whatever it may be that you've convinced yourself, I'm just, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm all right. 
Can you imagine? Can you imagine being part of that crowd? Seeing the signs of Jesus. Understanding something of the scriptures. The Messiah will come. And they see this man of God. They've heard John the Baptist testify of him. And you begin to look at him and you think, this, 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 is, this could be the Messiah. I think I believe. This is the Messiah. And then to realize Jesus doesn't commit himself to you because he knows what's in your heart. You're like that rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus knew again exactly what's in his heart. Said to him, go and sell what you have. Not that that's the way into the kingdom. But God knew, Jesus knew what was in his heart, you see. He knew what was holding that young man back. And he walked away sad. And only Jesus, only God, is the discerner of the hearts, friends. So there are these three options for us, as it were. Trusting in man and flesh, human knowledge. A complete and utter trust in God, which is where we want to be. Or we will also be in danger of trusting our own hearts. The most dangerous of all, if I can put it that way. Most deceptive of all. And this is why church is so important. We need one another. We need one another to carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need each other to, to call each other. I want us just to read Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. As a practical way, how? How do we expose our heart? How do we come to the Lord and we just allow Him to do open heart surgery on us? In Hebrews 4 verse 11, and He's been talking to them here already about today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Okay? A hard heart. <laughs> how do we get hard hearts? When we hold on to things that we should not, friends, unforgiveness is a big one. Anger, resentment, fears, all the things of the flesh. You know, you can read about these things in the Word of God. Sure signs that we are living in the flesh. When we are fearful, we're afraid, we're anxious. Outbursts of anger, wrath, jealousies, envies, all those things are not of God. They're of the flesh, and we have a hard heart. Do not harden your hearts. God wants us to enter into his promised rest. Verse 10, for he has entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his work as God did from, from his. And verse 11 says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall uh, according to the same example of this um, disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. <laughs> It's pretty plain language, isn't it? It's pretty straightforward. He sees everything about us. There's nothing we can hide from him. We can easily hide things from people around about us. We can even hide things between husband and wife. Your whole life. You can tuck something away. But you cannot hide anything from the one who created you. But get this, friends. He doesn't want you to be in that helpless state. He wants you to be free. He knows it all already. All He wants for you is to turn to Him and to open your heart and to allow Him in to come and cleanse you and to set you free from that thing that's holding you back. Let the Word of God discover your condition. Let the Word of God speak deep into your heart and into my heart this morning. Let Him discern the innermost thoughts and intents of our hearts. And so let him discover, discover our condition. And so may we come to him. <laughs> As Isaiah said, I have come undone. <laughs> I am a man of unclean lips. <laughs> I need to be saved. 
I need to be born again of the Spirit of God. Friends, I want to encourage us this morning. You know, the devil so easily deceives us and helps us to feed our own hearts and our own deception that we can so easily continue down a path that we tell ourselves it's okay when it's not. And I want to encourage us this morning because I believe, I absolutely believe with all my heart, we're living in a time now where God is making things, like I said, easy for us as Christians to become detached from the world. Go with it. If I can say that. Go with it. Let go. Let go of those things in this world. They're going to come to nothing. It's only in Him that we have life. He is the very author of life. He's the one who gave the breath of life, which is why it's foolish, absolute foolishness to trust in anything else. <laughs> it's all cursed. And it will all come to nothing. Only that which is rooted and planted in God, that tree, that picture of that tree, friends, always bearing its fruit, always bearing its fruit. Because we planted by the living waters. You know, Jeremiah says this in uh, verse 12. We read it when we started the service. Oh, glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Oh, Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written on the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. The very life that we live comes from Him. But that life will die. We need eternal life. You know, death was never God's plan for humanity. He came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. And the only way we can have that life is if we are planted, we are rooted in Him. And we allow Him to live through us. So what about our hearts? Please turn with me to Romans 5. I'll finish with this this morning. You know, last week, I think it was, we spoke a little bit about faith, guarding our faith. That is the combat. That is the battle. Is for our faith. And we said that without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God rewards those who diligently seek him. And in Romans 5 verse 1 it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, praise God, it's by faith that we are saved, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Do you see that? tree planted by the waters in the difficult times. It is still producing. It is still doing what it's supposed to do when everything else around about it is withering and dying. In verse 5, now hope does not disappoint. <laughs> there is not, this is not a type of hope. I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. <laughs> and then we wake up and we're disappointed. This is a living hope, an anchor for our soul. It is steadfast. It is sure. It will not disappoint. This hope does not disappoint because the love of God has, see past tense, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If we do not have the love of God being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us, we sit with a deceitful, wicked heart that will deceive us time and time and time again. The only remedy, <laughs> as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. There is no hope for you, friends, this morning. And I'm saying this to us. I don't know why the Lord has laid this on my heart so heavily this morning. But there is no time for religion. There is no space for self-righteousness. It's only those who live in Christ and have Christ in them, the hope of glory. There is no other way. 
Everything outside of that is death and enmity against God, even though it looks very rosy on the outside. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in your hearts, friends. Paul told us how many times, you know, the, the fruits of the Spirit, those things that you'll see, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That's how you know if somebody's living in the Spirit. But if you're struggling with envy and strife and outbursts of wrath and addictions and, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of sexual sins and stuff like that, that is not the Spirit of God. It's pretty clear. And we need to be sure where we're at. But there is a remedy. There is a remedy. Jesus came and he was the remedy. So whilst we have that deceitful, wicked heart, it just needs to be replaced with a new heart, alive unto God. And God gives us this through his Holy Spirit. So I said I was going to close with that one. Let me close with 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. I don't want us to walk away discouraged this morning, friends. It's just something I believe the Lord is challenging each and every one of us. Let's not get caught up with the, the waves of, I mean, we're going to see so much of this as we go about. Celebrating mankind. Celebrating man's achievements. How we have overcome, how we've made a way and we'll prevail. And it reminds me of the Tower of Babel. You know, we will make a name for ourselves. And God was very displeased. And you know, it's not that God is an angry God in heaven looking down, just waiting to zap humanity all the time. How it must grieve the Father's heart when he knows, I've created them. I made them in my image. And I have shown them the way. I have shown them the way even out of their fallen state through, their, uh, through my son. And yet they insist on following the dictates of their own heart. And it must especially grieve the Lord when his own followers, those who believe in him, get swept into these things as well. No, our faith is in the Lord. 2 Thessalonians, 5, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 from verse 5. And Paul just says this after he asked for prayer for their ministry. He says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. That is my prayer for every single one of us this morning, friends. Is our trust in the world, are we be deceived by our heart, or is our trust in the God of gods, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords? Amen. Shall we stand together this morning and we just pray? And if the Lord's spoken to you this morning, friends, I know sometimes the Lord really lays a hard message on my, on my heart, but it's it speaks to me first and it, it shakes me as well. And, I, and, I, and I, I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I don't want to be like so many others have been caught out because they follow the dictates of their own hearts and they make themselves believe it's all okay. And I want to say to us this morning, if you're here and you know it is well with my soul, praise God. Amen. But if you know that you've got that niggling conviction, that is a good sign. Just that niggle. That conviction, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you know, there's an area of my life I have not dealt with. I have not brought it into the light. I've not brought it before the Lord because maybe secretly I quite enjoy that sin. Yeah? And you've now got to a place where you've even allowed yourself to think, it's okay. It's all covered by grace. And you begin to deceive yourself. Friends, it's a very dangerous place to be. If that conviction is there this morning, I want to just ask you earnestly this morning, Respond to it. Respond to it. Don't let this day go by. Don't go to bed tonight and allow that thing to remain. You deal with it. You deal with it. You bring it to the Lord. He knows about it altogether anyway. And all I believe He wants to hear from us is just to say, Lord, I do not have the strength within me to deal with this. It's too big for me. I hand it over to you. I hand it over to you. Because you know what you're doing then? You're just dying before the Lord. 
and you're asking him to revive you and to breathe new life. And you know, I think that just pleases the Lord. And I want to encourage you this morning. And if you, again, if you believe this morning, it is well with your soul, then rejoice. Thank the Lord for that. Thank him for his goodness. And remember, every tree that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Allow him to prune. Amen. As he does in his church, he prunes. He's constantly at work. And we should allow him to do his work. So I'm just going to give us a minute. We just stand in silence. And you just bring these things to the Lord. And then I'll pray. And of course, you know, we're here afterwards if you want somebody to pray with you. But just spend some time before the Lord. Thank you that you are such a good father, Lord. There is no good father on the face of this planet. The best father ever, as it were, Lord, would not compare to you and your amazing grace and your love toward a fallen human race. And we thank you for your amazing grace. And Lord, I thank you that you speak to our hearts. I thank you that you are doing a mighty work in your church today, a, a refining work, Lord, a, a, a genuine pruning work that is taking place. And Lord, and I just pray that you continue to do your work. I pray for each and every one of us here today that we would just allow you, Lord, that we would just make ourselves vulnerable before you this day and to say, Lord, come and tend to us. Come and highlight those things that are not right in our own lives, Lord, as displeasing unto you. Lord, where we have been cold, we have been removed from that passion that we once had for your word and an excitement that we had when we read the Bible and we knew these were words of truth and we wanted to live our life for you completely and utterly. I pray that this morning, this day, you would revive us again unto yourself, Lord. Breathe new life in us. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us this morning, those things that you are highlighting by the power of your Holy Spirit, even now, Lord, I pray that we would give us the courage just to be able to bring it to you and to confess our sins before you, Lord, and allow you to cleanse us and to heal us. And by your power, you would do a mighty work. Lord, I pray that you continue to work in your church. Strengthen us. Lord, prepare us for the days that lie ahead. And Lord, I pray that as we go day by day and we see this world on a path that, Lord, we don't even fully understand, but that our eyes would be on you and we would put our trust in you because we know your promises are sure. They are yes and they are amen in you. And Lord, we just pray that we would stand firm on Christ, our solid rock, and not look to the things around about us. Lord, I pray for every troubled heart, even this morning. Lord, there's, there's so many that feel troubled, particularly about the vaccine. I pray that, Lord, you'd give everyone peace, whatever decision they should take before you. But Lord, that they would go to you and you alone. That we would hear from you and you alone. And that you would give us the certainty in our heart. Lord, I pray that you'd open our ears that we would hear you in this time. Father God, forgive us for the times when we lend our ears to so many things. So many things that just pump us full of fear and anxiety. I pray that you help us to discern right between what is right and what is wrong, between what is true and what is lies. And I pray that, Lord, you just fill our hearts with your joy again and you direct our hearts into the love of God, as Paul says, Lord. And that we can know that, Lord, we have the very love of God living in us and that this deceitful, wicked heart can be revived and be alive unto you and can bear much fruit for the glory of your name. 
So I pray, Lord, that you bless each and every one of us. Lord, all those words that weren't of you this morning, that would bring condemnation, that the enemy would seek to use, I pray that those would come and fall to the ground. But Lord, those words that you've spoken to each and every one of us, that they would take root and that, Lord, it would bear fruit for your name's sake, bring all glory to your name. We ask you in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for anybody who doesn't know you this morning, those who may be listening in this morning, I pray that, Lord, by your power of your Holy Spirit, you convict their hearts this morning. Call them unto yourself. May they surrender unto you. And so may you give them this new birth, this new life in you, we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 May God bless you folks. Thank you so much for your time.